Hello, I'm glad to have you with us. I'm Danielle Walker, Senior Reporter at SC Magazine, and I'd like to welcome you to today's webcast entitled Cracking the Confusion Between Encryption and Tokenization. This session is sponsored by Vormetric. Our speakers today are Charles Goldberg, who's the Senior Director of Product Marketing at Vormetric, and Rich Mogul, who is the Analyst and CEO of Circurosis. The two will not only delineate the purposes of encryption and tokenization today, but guide our listeners on selecting the best approach for their business and compliance needs. Rich brings 20 years of experience in info security, physical security, and risk management, while Charles also brings two decades of experience on the research, sales, product management, and marketing side. With that, I will hand things over to Rich, who will start the presentation. Thank you, and thanks, everyone, for joining us today. So what we're going to do over the next, uh, well, it's about 40, 40 minutes or so of the time that I've got today is dig into encryption. And a very specific kind of encryption. We're going to be focusing on what's going on in data centers. And so what I mean by that, and as you'll see as we get through the content, is applications, databases, servers, and storage, uh, as well as a bit of cloud computing. So, you know, kind of the, the big iron parts of encryption. We're not going to be talking about laptops and desktops. We're not going to be talking about um, dealing with SSL or TLS issues, as fun as that would be this week with the latest vulnerability, but the kinds of things that are you know, really back to the most critical information that you tend to have in your organization. And what's really fascinating right now is, look, I've been covering crypto for a long time. Uh, I started back, it was the very first thing I covered when I was an analyst over at Gartner. So I think if you combine my analyst career, I mean, that's probably pushing about 14, 15 years ago. Uh, and, and really, there wasn't a lot of use back then. And then we kind of had a surge of, uh, of encryption with backups after a bunch of backup tapes were getting lost. And breach disclosures uh, started occurring for the first time. But, you know, in, we had another little bit of a search with PCI. But to be completely honest, if you really, if you watch the crypto market and you watch the adoption of encryption, it's really been increasing dramatically over the past few years, and, and especially over the past two to, um, one to two years, in large part driven by what I like to refer to as the three Cs, cloud compliance and covert affairs. What I mean by that is that organizations are increasingly adopting cloud computing, and anytime you're trusting somebody else with your data, you tend to be a little bit wary about that. And so we've seen a lot of interest in encrypting for cloud computing to protect data in multi-tenant environments. The other is for compliance. Compliance has kept increasing, uh, and the requirements, uh, not even just the requirements themselves, uh, many of which do require encryption, particularly around financial information, PII, and healthcare, but it's that some of the enforcement has increased, but other people just want to keep out of the headlines. So even if encryption isn't mandated, people want to go ahead and encrypt the more data than they had previously, because if something bad happens, they want to say that they did encrypt. And then lastly, covert affairs. Uh, this has actually been especially true in Europe, but as well as here in the United States, where people are worried because of all the disclosures that have come out, um, thanks to Edward Snowden and the NSA, uh, as well as a lot of the breaches that we now know are, are nation-state sponsored or nation-states are involved with those. And so that kind of espionage area has really, uh, you know, kicked off. Look, I'm not saying that that's a real risk for all of you. I am saying that it's the kind of thing that gets into people's heads and right or wrong. It's become a reason some organizations encrypt, even if they really aren't at, at any material risk or any kind of loss that's associated with that kind of activity. Uh, and so... Because of all of that, we see greater use of encryption. We also see anytime there's more of a market out there for people to do things and more interest, more companies are going to jump into the fray. Now, a little bit of background. Be clear, all of my content here I'm talking about is completely independent. You guys can see all this stuff up on the Securosis blog or anything else. I'm not going to talk about specific products. That's just not what I'm here for. I'm going to talk about kind of the, um, the general issues around encryption and how to do this and make a right, the right decision for your organization. And what we're seeing is that things are getting more confusing because there's a lot of different kinds of needs that people have. Uh, the vendors are out there trying to fill those needs, but now we have more options than we've ever had before, which also means that if you're new to this area in particular um, or you're trying to do encryption in kind of a new way or for a new sort of uh, for a new initiative, that it's going, you know, the odds are it can, you know, definitely become more confusing. So what we're going to focus on is the encryption system. I'm not going to get into the individual algorithms. We're not going to talk about the primitive algorithms, pseudo-random number generators, 
different kind of modes. Do you use EBC or CBC? Well, the answer is almost always CBC or any of those kinds of things. Uh, the focus of what we're going to talk about is actually building the practical application of encryption within your organization to protect your data. So data encryption, practical application of it. And so it's built on all of those building blocks, and they are very important. You mess up your algorithms, if the, the underlying things that, you know, the guts of the crypto system that you're using don't work, then the entire system breaks. But most of those are pretty good. And particularly if you're using commercial or even open source products, most of those implementations are pretty good. That stuff gets beat on all the time. That's not the problem. The problem becomes how do you piece your actual system together? Because what we find is, is that the strongest algorithms are worthless if the system itself is weak. Uh, at the same time, in the enterprise world, we need manageability. We're going to be managing multiple kinds of encryption in the data center, multiple applications, multiple different kinds of storage, and how do you actually manage all of that? And so it's that bigger picture system that we're going to focus on today because those are the pieces where we actually see more of the mistakes. Really strong crypto algorithm, and yet there's a pause in your in your key exchange or a pause in where you do the encryption um, and before something gets passed on from point A to point B, uh, and that's where the bad guys are able to get their hands on it. They don't have to crack, you know, a AES or anything along those lines, and they can't um, because all they have to do is find those places as you build out your system, where are those weak points. When we look at encryption systems, I like to break it down into three major components. And the relative security of your crypto system is going to come down to the positioning and, you know, obviously underneath the security of those components. So first is the data itself. Where is the data stored? Is it, you know, in a database? Is it an application? Where do you collect it? Where do you store it? Uh, and by the way, we're going to go through all of this and, and kind of how to put these pieces together. And I know this seems super basic right now, but, but trust me, you know, we just got to get everybody up on the same page. Then there's the encryption engine itself. Where's the actual cryptographic operation taking place? And then lastly, where are the keys managed? And then how do those components interact and where are those pieces uh, all exchanged between the three of them? Uh, and so the give you just a quick example. I've got some more diagrams later. Um, for example, when the backup in Okay, if you just encrypt the hard drive in your laptop, so I've got a Mac, FileVault has built-in encryption. In that case, the data is on the Mac, the encryption engine is on the Mac, and for mine, the key management is actually isn't the key, it's generated. Uh, when I type in my passphrase using, uh, you know, some kind of a password-based um, key generation derivation system. Uh, and so all three of those are in one place. If you're actually going ahead and doing encryption for, uh, you know, say an application, the data itself might be stored in a database, the encryption engine might be a separate cryptographic service, and the key management might be a separate appliance outside of it. We actually have those diagrams later. So it gives you a sense of what those pieces are. We'll talk about how you put those together later and what that, what that actually looks like, even on the next slide. But when does it make sense to encrypt? And that's why I came up with something called the three laws of data encryption. Um, this, again, was very targeted. This, I think I wrote that initially in, like, 2007, somewhere around that timeline. And the idea is, is, you know, when does encryption actually improve the security of what you're doing? And believe it or not, you can encrypt and not improve the security at all. So the three cases, the three times you want to look at using encryption are, first, if the data moves physically or virtually. So if it's going from point A to point B, if you've got laptops moving around, if you're worried about hard drives and servers, uh, or in, just say, your RAID, you pull a hard drive out, you want to make sure that sensitive data there isn't exposed so you don't have to physically destroy the drive. Uh, encryption will go ahead and take care of that. Um, or if it moves around virtually, as you're moving files around between yourselves and the cloud environment. Now, the next case, because in those cases, encryption will protect you from theft. And the next case is to enforce separation of duties more than you can get from access controls. And what we mean by this is, you know, access controls work really well. We don't see compromises of access controls for the most part. What we see is a user account gets compromised or somebody with valid access goes ahead and abuses that access, or somebody's done an account takeover to abuse that person's access. And so that's what we mean by separation duty beyond access control. More often than not, that comes down to administrators. For example, you have a server. The administrators need to admin that server. If you don't want them to see the data on that server, there's various forms of file encryption you can use. And if you architect it correctly, believe me, there's plenty of ways to architect it incorrectly, even a server administrator can't get access to the files on that particular server. 
Same thing for databases, same thing for applications. It's a good way to get separation of duties where it's really hard to get the access control themselves to work. And the last one is sometimes you just need to encrypt to hit a checkbox. Um, you know, typically it's compliant, call it mandated encryption. Uh, I have seen cases where uh, people do encryption and it offers absolutely no additional security value, no meaningful security value to do the encryption. It's only just to get the auditors off your back. Uh, an example is, is uh, for, um, let's take Amazon Web Services. The Amazon S3, the simple storage service, has a checkbox you can click that encrypts your data. Amazon controls the key. You don't control the key. Now, a few months ago, I actually announced the way where you can control the key, but this encryption feature is up for years before you could. So Amazon can have the key, which means Amazon employees can access the data, which means you get no additional separation of duty. Amazon already destroys those hard drives when they get moved around. Really didn't do anything, you know. And then when you, it was all server side encryption, so it didn't protect the data between you and Amazon. So it didn't protect it in motion. Didn't have separation of duty. Really, people were just using it to get the auditors off the back. So as much as that sounds silly, that's it's a real use case, and uh, we see that one happen all the time. So let me give you a more concrete example of how these things can piece together. And we'll talk about database encryption. And we're, we're going you know, within a couple of slides, we're going to get into a bunch more kind of these these sorts of things, but. Um, let's say you have a database and you want to protect the data. Well, there's three physical locations where that where you could potentially encrypt that data. You can do field level encryption. So suppose that database took credit card numbers, you would encrypt the credit card number field. Um, you could actually do that in the application outside of the database, or you can encrypt that field within the database. But when you encrypt that field within the database, does the database administrator have access to the keys? or do they not have access to the keys? If you're using the native database field encryption, they probably do have access to the keys. But it doesn't necessarily provide you separation of duties from the database administrator, or provide you separation of duties from the application admin, or would protect that data uh, that's coming in from the application. That's one of those or two ways of doing that. The other would be transparent database encryption, where you actually encrypt all the underlying files associated with the database, which can be done with an external tool, or again, can be done by the database itself. And in that case, it doesn't really get you separation of duties from the database administrators, but can protect a wider range of data. Or you can just encrypt the, the root storage itself. We see that a lot in cloud implementations where somebody will you know, um, encrypt the storage volume, which protects you from the cloud administrators, but again, not from the database administrators or anybody with legitimate access to the database. So, that's the layout of where the data itself resides and where the encryption engine would be. Uh, and, you know, within all of those, we have those different options. Where is the engine? Is it in the database or out of the database? Where does the data reside? Do you encrypt it before it goes into the database in the application? Do you encrypt it after it's out of the database, you know, in the storage files? And where are the keys managed? In this case, is it managed in a way where the database administrators could get to it? or a server administrator, or is it an external service where none of them have access to it? That's just one straight up example of all the various options that you can have when encrypting a database, and each one of those is going to go ahead and provide relatively different security value um, associated with them. So, by the way, uh, if you do have questions, we are going to do our best to answer those questions as of uh, and then we'll get to the rest of it at the end of the webcast. So please, you know, go ahead uh, and submit questions. Now, encryption isn't our only option for protecting data as well. And what we see now is a lot of the crypto systems, particularly the commercial ones, also include options for social maybe even for masking. So the difference is, if you haven't worked in this area before, encryption, out data, and then out you have a key. Uh, and you encrypt the data with the algorithm, and that data has its own key, and out of the other end comes ciphertext, which is just, you know, random gibberish text. That's different than tokenization. We'll spend more time on that later. I've got a whole another slide on it, which is where so you take something like a credit card number, you create a effectively a random token value that's used instead of the real credit card number, and then there's a highly secure database someplace, a secure repository, or when you really need to get that credit card number out, you exchange the token and you get the real credit card number out. And then there's masking, which is where you take data and you jumble it up so it doesn't look like the original data, um, generally in a non-reversible process. It's also not meant to be as, as secure, which is really good for things like generating test data or if you need to mask something dynamically as, as you know, for example, if somebody has access to the application and you don't want to see the, the data behind it, 
uh, but you still want the user interface and everything to look normal. Believe it or not, we actually see a bunch of implementations along those lines. Now, we have those three components that I talked about earlier. Where's the encryption engine? Where's the data? Where is the key management? There's also different layers you can, we can encrypt in, and I've already hinted at this is when I went through that database example. And uh, in, these, uh, in these cases, um, the layers that typically for data center stuff that we can encrypt at, it's at the application as you, call, as you get the data, within the database itself if it's structured data, within files, which databases have files, or if there's no database at all involved, you can just have files stored uh, someplace within your organization, and then the actual storage or volume um, on the back end. It could be everything from uh, a hard drive that you completely encrypt uh, to a, um, a hard drive to a backup tape to, you know, whatever you're, wherever you are storing it on the back end. Um, by the way, we are, I did just get word that uh, I might be breaking up a little bit. Apologies if that happens again. I can try uh, dialing in on a different, uh, different line. So I'll um, just go ahead and let the uh, moderators for the event know, and we'll get and we'll take care of that. So until then, I'm going to keep them running ahead. Now, what's interesting is, is some data will flow through all these layers. So if you build an application, you collect a credit card or something along those lines, it may flow all the way down to a database, which is then stored in files, which is then stored in a storage volume. The higher up the stack in the layers that you encrypt, the more it's protected. If I encrypt something in the application, which is generally good for discrete kinds of data fields, um, it's protected all the way down the stack. So and unless you go ahead and decrypt it someplace else in the stack, it's safe in the database, it's safe in files, it's safe in storage. Now, that sounds great. You'd love, we'd love to encrypt everything in the application, but A, we have a lot of data that just doesn't even come into applications or even databases. It's all sorts of data. Uh, the other is, is maybe our application wasn't built to handle it that way. Um, there's also more complexity involved. If you just increase the raw store, in, encrypt the raw storage on the bottom end, it may not protect it further up in the stack, but it might be a better choice from, an, from you know, a cost, efficiency, effectiveness standpoint. And if you map that back to the three rules we were talking about before, that actually helps you pick which layer. Because what's your security objective when you're going to encrypt? Where do you collect the data? Where does it, how does it flow through your stack? And then we can figure out where to place our various components to actually build out that encryption system. So what I'm going to do next is I'm going to start rolling through all of the various uh, layers that we have. Um, actually, I'm pausing for a moment because I thought we had our polling question that was coming up now once I uh, got things out of line. Um, let me see. I thought we had a slide for that. Okay, we do. So. Um, SC Magazine, go ahead and push in the poll right now. So just wanted to get a sense of what layers do you guys go ahead and encrypt in. We've got two quick polling questions. Uh, now, obviously, I probably expect a lot of you to, you know, check all of these boxes here. But, you know, again, just trying to get a general sense of where you tend to do most of your encryption. So wait a few seconds here for everybody to go ahead. And then the results will, uh, will pop up. All right, so hopefully that's enough time. If uh, our SC Magazine friends can go ahead and uh, pop up the results so we can take a look at that. Uh, so it does look like a lower view. Well, actually, some of these numbers are lower, to be honest. I uh, expected to, to hit higher numbers on all of it. So we do tend to see more hard drive volume encryption. That's pretty consistent with what I've seen when I work out there with customers, followed by file store, um, followed by databases, and then file store. Or I'm sorry, backup media. Um, so that's uh, looking pretty good. Now let's go ahead and push out our next question, please, which is, you know, do you, oh, which is, where would you prefer to encrypt? If you had druthers, you could do it yourself uh, and choose where you go to ahead and, and encrypt from, um, go ahead and let us know what would be your personal preference. All right, we'll give this a few more seconds. Okay, if we can go ahead, SC Magazine folks, if you could go ahead and push the results on this one. Yeah, <laughs> I was kind of hoping to see that, uh, which is 40% of you would prefer to encrypt in the application. And I'll be honest, when I'm designing new applications, you know, that, that's generally my preference as well. As much as possible, I look at trying to get that done in the application. 
Uh, if I can't do it, that's when I start dropping down the stack. Now, I did find that the 18% in databases is interesting uh, because uh, the uh, you know I don't always see that number. I often see the file um, storage piece go next. But database is probably where the bulk of the market has been when we actually to look at doing different kinds of application encryption uh, because it reduces some of the complexity of trying to integrate things into your application code. So, um, you know, that's uh, definitely some pretty interesting responses there. So I'm going to go ahead and only 4.7 backup. Well, yeah, I guess we all encrypt backups. We just prefer to have it encrypted uh, ahead of time. I forgot the way I asked my own question. All right, so when we close this out, we'll move forward to the next slide. And what we're going to do now is we're going to actually walk through the different encryption layers. So the first meaning uh, is application layer. So this is where we encrypt any application as we go ahead and actually collect the data. Uh, it can be part of the code or an external service. For example, I was just working with a client recently where we um, architected so that they would collect the data in the application that would be immediately shipped off to uh, an external cryptographic service. So this is a microservice architecture, kind of a web-facing sort of a thing. Uh, and then the application, and then once that encrypted data was, uh, that is what gets stored into the database, so the application didn't have to have knowledge of it. When the app needed to see the data, it would be decrypted before being given back to the application, assuming all the access permissions and everything else um, work properly. So you protect it at that higher level. It can be done within your app code. Um, typically, as a, a library you would put in place, you don't want to really code that stuff up yourself so you can avoid it. Protect the data before it ever hits the database. Now, the keys to this is you really need to be good about picking a good crypto library, using it properly. A lot of the crypto libraries, particularly the open source ones, don't come with the most secure default settings. Uh, they might, for example, be picking a weak pseudorandom number generator, depending on what operating system and hardware you're on. Uh, might have some key management issues, your application security. All of that becomes really critical uh, when you're encrypting up the app layer. It really does have additional complexity. You can't just you know, flip a switch and get your encryption done. And I mostly find this best for discrete data and for new applications. It can be harder to retrofit. If you are going to retrofit, you want to look at tokenization or format-preserving encryption, uh, which I've got a slide on later to go into more details about what those are. So based on your survey, based on my preference, when you have the option to encrypt in the app, it's going to protect everything all the way down. Go for it. Just understand, it's really easy to get it wrong. You really need to know what you're doing to get it right. Uh, you need to be very careful around the engine you're using, the key management you're using. Uh, and if it's an older application, you're probably going to want to look at format-preserving encryption or tokenization instead. Now, the next is at the database. And in the database, we tend to see two types of encryption use. The first on the right side is field-level encryption. So this is very similar to encrypting a discrete field as when it comes in over the application, except it's done by the database itself. Uh, it's only built into a few platforms, not many. To be honest, most clients I work with don't use it. Uh, they're either going to encrypt in the application or they're going to encrypt below it. Uh, it. It can be difficult or impossible to retrofit onto an existing application at this layer. Uh, it doesn't really restrict DBAs from accessing data. And, and really, if you're going to get down to the field level, you should do it outside of the database uh, as best you can. Um, the only alternative would be, for example, if you, again, try to pull in a third-party tool or something. but we really historically have a lot of issues with field-level encryption of the database, and it can lock you into that database platform more so than other kinds of things. The option we more commonly see is transparent database encryption. This is where the underlying file structure of the data is encrypted. It still doesn't protect against DBAs or anything along those lines, um, and it can be built into the database or it can be external. So there are tools out there that will actually encrypt the file structures underneath the database outside of the database. Uh, so not all databases support TDE is a big reason for that, um, depending on what version you're on, and, and also for the only key management, or if you want to get, you know, some, you can sometimes implement some better separation of duty. Um, you get your performance out of this for the most part. It used to be horrible, um, but a few years ago, uh, not probably closer to five plus years ago, things got a, uh, a lot better uh, in terms of not affecting database performance. Uh, badly, but you know it works well. It's the closest you get to flipping the switch and getting your stuff encrypted on the database. Doesn't do a lot of separation of duties for the DBAs, but it will for server administrators. It will protect your data in storage, uh, so it definitely still has some advantages to it. Now the next option is file. File is really versatile. I mean, it's the best for all different kinds of servers. 
uh, it, you know, we use file encryption, you know, all over the place um, to protect all everything from databases to unstructured data. It's all sorts of different ways of, of implementing file level encryption within your organization. So for unstructured data, clearly this is one of the better ways to go, particularly if that data needs to move around at all. Just understand that, you know, the keys aren't going to move with the data. So uh, you got to make sure you get the right, you know, you're encrypting your files at the right level of access and you have the right system set up so people who need to get to it can get to it. Uh, it can actually be good for enforcing separation duties. There's products you can install on a server so that a server administrator can't necessarily get to the, the files on that server, especially if you're using directory-based authentication so that the server admin can't change user permissions in a way to give themselves access to the data on that file server. Uh, it's also really good for cloud, particularly if you want to protect things you're moving up to the cloud. And to be honest, it can be as simple as single files. So, for example, here for Securosis, um, we use a lot of cloud storage services. We actually trust them. I think they're secure. The one we use, uh, I we use, you know, I know is encrypted. But we had one file where we really wanted to keep control over it. It was our corporate financials. So for that one, we went ahead, we encrypted ourselves before we ever sent it to the cloud provider. It's fully protected, and yet all of us on the inside of the company can still access it, or those of us that need to access it. Really straightforward, easy to do. Now, the last is one, volume or disk encryption, which everyone's probably pretty familiar with. You see the least separation of duties. This is really that moving around physically or virtually protection. Um, really good for backup. It can also be good for cloud scenarios because if you encrypt the storage volume and you control the key, that will prevent anybody from your cloud provider gaining access to that data. So that's a scenario where you do get that separation of duties where it can make a lot of sense to go ahead and do that disk encryption. Um, also good for portable storage, or if you're just worried about disposing your drives. So pulling hard drives out of a RAID, that's the kind of situation where you're going to want to go ahead and potentially look at uh, using volume encryption. So um, we did have one question. So masking changes the content, but not the form of the data. And I wanted to go ahead and answer that, uh, sort of. So um, masking uh, generally will not change the form of the data. Yeah, it does change the content. Uh, and typically, it's a one-way operation. So you're not going to be able to retrieve that data on the back end. So the example is you take a production database and you convert it into, into test data, and we call it, and that's a, a version of data masking. And there's also dynamic masking, which will do it on the fly for things like if you have a call, service, call center rep and you don't want them to see a real social security number and you don't want to break your application, you can actually go ahead and use masking so they get a fake social security number. All right. So, you know, this slide's a little bit ugly. Uh, it's just some examples of all the different kind of options uh, where you can put these things. So one example here, if you're going to do full disk encryption on the laptop, as I talked about, you can have external key management, which is if you're in an enterprise environment, that's likely what you have, external keys um, that you're dealing with for your applications. The data is on the hard drive, and the encryption engine is in, within the operating system or something that's installed on that laptop. Database encryption, we kind of went through in depth. Uh, there, you know, key management should generally be outside the database is my preference. Um, but then you can also potentially that red dot have it in the database. Uh, the encryption engine tends to be in the database itself, and the data itself is ends up being down there stored in files. Uh, the next is for cloud, and kind of the example, some of the examples we see is you could have the crypto engine, uh, which is in an in instance in a virtual machine in your environment. Uh, that's protecting data on an external storage volume, and the key management occurs outside of that. And that's just another common scenario. So it's just showing you all the different ways that you can kind of uh, go ahead and put these pieces together. Now, for your key management, generally you've got three main options that we see out there. Uh, the first is hardware. So this could be a, an HSM or another kind of a hardware appliance. These things have extensive physical security. Some of these, when you open up the lid, it just wipes all the data inside, so they're tamper-proof. Uh, it also has acceleration, so that has, you know, chips to increase the cryptographic operations. And some of them are just key operations, and others are actual cryptography, uh, encryption and decryption uh, that's occurring in between them. Uh, and they're really good. A lot of organizations like this because you a nice hardware chain of trust or root of trust. So you've got that hardware root of trust, where you know that if anybody touches that physical appliance in the wrong way, it'll go ahead and wipe out your keys uh, and protect them. Uh, and you need things like smart cards to go in and do administrative changes like key rotations and such. So, you know, definitely very popular. 
even a lot of the cloud-based things and other things we see today, somewhere, someplace, have a hardware root of trust to keep those keys safe. There's also software. Um, we do see full software implementations, uh, software you can install um, um, you know, on the server itself for key management. Uh, we don't see a lot of this anymore. It, it's kind of bounced around a little bit. Typically, we'll see more software based for things like uh, managing all the keys for your laptop you're encrypting in your organization. We see it a lot less for things like uh, encrypting uh, within the data center. Um, but we do see it in some cases. And then lastly, virtual appliances, which we used to not see much of at all, and now we're seeing more of, where it's basically software and a hardened virtual appliance that's all pre-configured. And the reason that this has become a little bit more popular is if you're dealing with cloud and virtualization, you don't necessarily want to have to connect to a hardware appliance for all your key operations for late, due to latency reasons. You need the keys close to your application, for example. And so what you do is you have a virtual appliance that just has a subset of keys for your organization that you need for that particular application or whatever. So you'll still get a nice separation of duties. And then that connects back to the appliance usually multiple appliances for backup reasons, that becomes your root of trust on the back end. Um, so it minimizes the key exposure, uh, but allows you to still handle the performance latency kind of issues that you need to when you're working in particular in virtualized environments. Now, there's also a lot of ways uh, or a few ways that clients will go ahead and actually access the key managers to pull those keys out and get them into the encryption engines where you need them. One is by a protocol or a standard. There are a number of key exchange protocols that are out there, um, and those are standardized so that if you have a crypto engine, the, if it's running off of that, it should be able to get keys from any standard compliant key manager uh, that's out there. Because um, And so it's just how those key exchanges uh, occur, similar to how we handle you know, certificate authorities and public key exchanges. It could be via a direct API call. So you can make an API call to the key manager, uh, and it could be either to pull a key out to perform a signing operation uh, or to put data in and get decrypted data out. It, it, you know, again, assuming the key manager is more than a key manager and it's an actual full encryption appliance that could potentially do crypto operations. So we see API access to go ahead and, and get uh, and, and manage to deal with those keys. And the last is a dedicated software agent. And that software agent could be uh, a full executable agent, binary agent that's running on a system. It can also be a library so that you can integrate the encryption into your application. Um, it just means that you don't have to go ahead and, and obviously code up all the, the cryptographic engine yourself. Um, you're able to use a pre-built agent that's designed to work specifically with that key manager that um, where you actually are handling all of your key, um, handling all the keys for your organization. Uh, next up is tokenization. I mentioned I was going to talk about this more because uh, tokenization is pretty interesting. We see it a lot in particular around financial data and PII, where the data does need to move around a lot, where you have a lot of existing dependencies and applications that are looking for things that look like a credit card number, that are a credit card number, uh, except you want to go ahead and reduce your risk. And so tokenization can do that because the way that that works is different is there's a key piece there, which is your tokenization server. And what the tokenization server is, is it's a secure environment. And on the back end, it probably has a database where a credit card number goes in, so it's usually encrypted using just, you know, public key cryptography, sent to the tokenization server, and then the tokenization server goes ahead and uh, creates a token. And the token is either random or semi-random. There's a bunch of different techniques for creating tokens. Uh, that token is associated with that specific credit card number. And the credit card number is locked away in that token database forever. And only the token is sent out back to the application. And what that means is, is the application server, the database, and all the other dependent systems, they never deal with the real credit card number. They are only dealing with the token. That token is unique to that organization or that application. So if a bad guy steals it, they can't just go to the store. They can't load it up on, you know, as an Apple Pay you know, card or uh, ID or anything else. It's just not usable outside of that particular context. It's also really good because if you're dealing with something like PCI, it can reduce or eliminate entire parts of your PCI scope. If there's no way to go ahead and get that token, convert that token back to a credit card number, 
then that can be excluded from your assessments for PCI. Then, when you actually need to go ahead and do a payment, like a payment system and authorized application there, um, that's when the tokenization service can convert that back to a credit card number, again, in that more secure, that more kind of locked down environment. So tokenization is uh, pretty interesting. Uh, the tokens generally will come out looking like a real credit card number, so you can actually replace real numbers in your environment with tokens, um, reducing your risk, reducing your, your audit and assessment scope. Uh, and again, we see them in other areas, but primarily we're seeing them used mostly in, uh, in payment systems or on credit cards and account numbers. Now, for databases, um, when we're looking at dealing with the, um, let me um, and give you an example of what this would look like, is if you encrypt the database, you have your key management server, you drop the key back into the database, and you can turn that credit card number, social security number, goes back from ciphertext to plain text, it's all actually hand within the database. Um, oops, clicked the wrong button, my previous instead of my next where when you tokenize something, it's just a token that's stored in all those other databases. And so that's one of the reasons where tokenization become valuable is it kind of spreads out throughout your environment. You can use those tokens without, um, without having to go ahead and retrofit a lot of things. So I've talked a lot about different options out there. We talked about the different ways to build an encryption system or the different components. We talked about the layers of encryption. Talk about the three laws, which is really meant to help you guide guide you toward picking the right encryption approach for what you're doing. We talked a bit about the technology and how all these pieces can mix and match together. Let's you know get down to reality here. What are some specific recommendations? So if I look across the top use cases that are out there, um, for example, um, which is the ones that we've got listed on this page, uh, we actually have a white paper that I wrote uh, myself and one of my partners here, uh, Adrian Lane, that we're also going to be giving you guys a preview release of at the end of this session where we have, a, I think, one or two more use cases. Um, but these are the most common use cases that we see out there where people are looking at doing this database level encryption. So I'm sorry, the next <laughs> data center level encryption. Uh, the first is an application. And this is where you need to encrypt the discrete element. Um, I think that, you know, really this is your best option. And if you go ahead and do it, I highly recommend using either a secure crypto library or in an external crypto service tied in with an external key management system to go ahead and actually handle your encryption. It's really easy to make mistakes. There are drop-in libraries and drop-in agents that can often help you with this. There's even some API-based encryption now that's become available. Um, so all the crypto operations can be done uh, on a secure appliance or virtual appliance. Um, so for, for applications, if you're getting everything from a password to you know, credit card numbers, any, of the, any sensitive information from customers, that's definitely a ripe area to perform that encryption. Um, I would recommend doing it there as opposed to in the database. Because if you're going to go down to the database layer, if it's discrete fields, I really recommend you go and you do it in the application instead. Uh, and if you have existing stuff you're already operating, then pull in tokenization or even format preserving encryption. But um, and I, I tend to prefer tokenization where possible over over FPE. Uh, because if you want to do the discrete field, really you should be doing it more at the application layer. If you have a database, though, and you understand the separation of duties limitations of it, but you really just need to get it encrypted, that's when really I'd look at, at transparent database encryption, uh, either from the database platform itself or from an external product. Either one you use, use external key management. Don't manage that key within that database. There's way too many ways for that key to get exposed if you're actually managing it directly within the database. You always want to use something on the outside. Um, when it comes to payments, if it's something new, you could look at doing regular application encryption, but any time you actually are storing things like a credit card number, uh, I think tokenization is the way to go. There's really some cool tokenization uh, options that have kind of hit out there, which is where um, the uh, uh, where basically in some cases you can wipe out, as I was saying before, you know, vast areas of your, your PCI scope. Uh, and then the last example here is for cloud. Um, if you're going to be doing cloud stuff, again, try and encrypt discrete, if it's discrete data, try and encrypt it up in the application. If you can't encrypt it there, that's when I start saying look at file or volume encryption, knowing that it's just protecting you from your cloud, um, somebody from your cloud provider actually accessing your data. And again, I'm talking more of the data center infrastructure as a service. We're not talking too much, um, really software as a service here. Now, the problem, you know, that it's not even a problem. The thing to keep in mind is, if you're using one of the major cloud services, their employees 
They're so restrictive, they're not going to gain access to your data without you knowing about it, but you probably would have a compliance reason to go ahead and to um, actually do things at that level. So going on to, you know, to support this, we went ahead and put together a decision tree. And so that decision tree is in the white paper itself, which we're going to provide you at the end. By the way, you're also going to get all the slides at the end. And what it does is it's our way of kind of guiding you towards what is likely, you know, the best option for you. Now, we don't have time to go through the entire decision tree here. It, it's pretty big, obviously. It takes up a full page in the guide. But to give you an example of how to use it, um, if you come in and you're looking at application encryption, is it an existing or a new application? Uh, if it's a new application, is all of the data sensitive? Well, if so, then we list out your options. So uh, database, transparent database encryption, file encryption, or volume drive encryption. And we list in the order of preference, so top to bottom around that. So if most of the data in the database is sensitive, PDE is probably, or the file-based ver version of it uh, is, you know, likely where you want to go. Then if that doesn't work, you work on some other kind of file encryption. Now remember, I, I lump in third-party things that provide the equivalent of PDE as PDE. Um, now, if that doesn't work, you can actually try to encrypt the files yourselves, which is different than one of these uh, systems that's optimized to perform for a database, which is why I dropped that lower. Uh, and then volume and drive encryption um, would be at the, at the lower end. So that's actually dropping us, even though we went through the application, it drops us in the database. And a couple of areas you'll see I just directly point back up to and say, hey, do it in the application um, and handle things there. Uh, if we actually go ahead and look, for example, for server level, you see for the most part, I think file encryption is your best option to protect against privileged users. But if all you're worried about is drives moving around, then we would recommend volume or drive level encryption. Um, for cloud, we did actually include a little bit of platform as a service and software as a service, but that's only a very high level. Uh, this paper and, and the research we've been doing and what I'm talking about today, uh, we definitely don't have the time to get into all the ins and outs of you know, software as a service, encryption proxies, and gateways, and those kinds of things. So I'm going to go ahead, pop off another question or two, and then uh, finish up my section, turn it over to Charles. And then when he's done, we'll actually get to the rest of the questions at the end. But there were a couple that kind of stood out for me. So one uh, question came in um, is, please explain if the key server attack, how do you ensure data security isn't a single point of failure? Yep, sure it. You, you lose your key management server if somebody gains access to that then they also gain access to where the encryption is performed, you're in trouble. So um, that's why, you know, I really recommend you, you be darn sure you know what you're doing when you set up your key management server. Um, we, for the most part, remember, this is the stuff that's used by all the biggest banks and everybody else in the world, these kinds of approaches that I was talking about here. So we know that they work and there's some good best practices to go ahead and actually um, make sure that that data is still protected. Now, if uh, the next one is, you know, uh, related, kind of related to that, um, what's the best way to protect data in the database and database administrators? Well, the best way to do that is encrypt it before it goes into the database. Once it goes into the database, you can't rely on an encryption mechanism that the DBAs can manage. That changes from platform to platform. So how Oracle handles that is different than Microsoft, is different than MySQL. Some platforms, like MySQL, have no built-in encryption options. Others, like Oracle, have a lot in different ways to restrict DBAs. My general rule of thumb is if you want to protect against DBAs, you have to encrypt outside of what a DBA is able to access. Um, and I guess a little complex. Charles might actually want to address that later because I know they have some approaches that they take for, for that particular kind of problem. But the easiest thing to do is make sure you encrypt that data before it gets into the database. That gives you that best separation of duties. If you do it within the database, then things get a little bit tricky uh, at that point in time. So, I wanted to answer just a couple of questions before we went over to, to my summary. Don't worry, we'll get to the rest uh, hopefully before the end because we've got a bunch of them in there. And, uh, you know, as a reminder, the construction of your encryption system matters as much or more than the algorithms and the low-level concern. Uh, you know, we just see uh, time after time, if there's a breach and data was encrypted and that data was exposed, it's because of mistakes of how that crypto system was built. So it's the positioning of your components that defines the overall security and effectiveness of your system. In general, for discrete data, you want to encrypt or tokenize with the application as most you can. And for something like compliance, where all you need to do is hit the checkbox, encrypting lower in storage might be more cost-effective and easier um, to go ahead and implement in your organization. 
I, even though it, even if it might not necessarily be as secure, we have a lot of stuff to where we don't you know, need that same level of security. So I thank you all for your time. I've run out of my 45 minutes, but Charles, it's time for me to kick it over to you. Great. Thank you very much, Rich, and thank you to SC Magazine and Danielle for hosting us today. So, yep, I'm Charles Goldberg. I run product marketing here at Prometric. And just very quickly, I just want to take you through the Prometric data security platform and how we meet a lot of the use cases that Rich just spelled out for us. And then I want to focus in on our newest product offering, which is tokenization. So I'm going to jump right into it because I really want to get to all your questions. And I appreciate so many coming in, and, and please keep them coming. So there to start, and as Rich talked about, there's a lot of different use cases out there. Uh, we, all, we all have data in uh, physical or virtual data centers. More often than not, that's becoming outsourced. We're continuously gaining new projects, which is going to move data to other places, whether it's remote servers at uh, stores or remote offices, moving to the cloud. And cloud can mean a lot of different things, public, private, hybrids, SaaS, PaaS, infrastructure as a service, everything in between. And more and more often, our customers are coming to us with new big data projects. And all these projects either have sensitive data going in to them, or they have no idea what kind of data is going in, so it might be sensitive data. And that's just going to be forever growing. So there's different approaches that could be taken. Uh, the traditional approach is you get a project, you find an encryption solution. And that encryption solution could be really varied. It could be homegrown. It could be commercial off the shelf. It could come from multiple vendors, have different types of key management with different levels of attention to that key management. And at the end, when you look back, each of these projects that took the individual approach leaves a very complex, inefficient, and expensive uh, set of solutions. And, and this is expensive for the business. And sometimes mistakes are made, you know, like we've recently seen with Uber, where they didn't do proper key management and it appears that's how they lost their database. So I kind of want to get a feel for what our audience is doing today. So if we could pull out, push out the third and last polling question, I'd appreciate it. So I'd like to get a feel for how you typically encrypt or tokenize or protect your data today in your business. So give you about 20 seconds to pick one of these three options. Do you homegrown? Do you have like built-in solutions like a TDE or do some kind of homegrown encryption? But you know how important key management is, so you do buy a commercial key management solution. Or do you tend to do a full commercial solution? What's your primary go-to-market or go to protect your data? Okay, can we see the results of the poll, please? Okay, so good mix here. Um, good to see that a lot of people are using professional key management in their solutions. And uh, good amount of homegrown, so actually you know, more than I would have expected. But great, thank you very much. So what Vimetric offers is the data security platform. And our goal is to enable you to have a data security protection strategy in your business. So whether you have unstructured data, like files to protect, structured data, like any database that you need to protect. And as Rich was talking about, sometimes you want to protect it at the application level. So then we offer you the abilities to add application encryption in a very easy way to existing applications or to add tokenization in case, for whatever reason, you know, the preference is tokenization, and which you know, gave us those reasons. Or um, what's easiest to deploy is file-level encryption. So that we call Vermetric Transparent Encryption. And what makes that so easy is you don't have to do any changes to your application. It'll work on any storage environment. And it's very flexible for moving into data centers, virtual data centers, remote services, and into the cloud. Um, and then we offer, on top of that, privileged user access control. So that was part of the 
question that came up, and Rich said Charles will talk about it a little bit more. So I'll take this moment. Uh, part of our Vermetric Transparent Encryption solution is, unlike other encryption solutions, once, like, once you get the key, then they're finished, right? They unencrypt the data, and everyone has free access. That's what full disk encryption does. That's what volume level encryption does. But Vermetric is different. We continue to enforce policy on the access of that data. So if one user has the key, they can now get the data in clear text. But a system admin tries to access that data, we will continue to enforce the policy, see that that user is root, and not allow them to access the data. And even if they were to do a sudo command or a switch user command and pretend to be an authorized user, since we're at the file system level and we're process aware, we know that user is trying to circumvent the protection and the policy of the system. So we'll stop the data and we will or stop the access and we'll log all that. So it's a very rich solution for privilege user access control as well. But what I want to focus in is our newest product, and that's tokenization with dynamic data masking. So what we're talking about with this solution is your traditional tokenization type problems that need uh, that a tokenization would solve. So for example, you have an accounts payable person that gets credit card numbers. They need to enter those credit card numbers into a system and potentially pull out the full credit card system, uh, credit card number. But you have customer service users who only need to say, what's your last four digits of your credit card? So there's no reason to expose the full credit card. Now, you could have your app developers become tokenization experts or application encryption experts, or you could let them do what they do best and call APIs. So for tokenization, as the example here, we use REST APIs. And your app developers look at our SDK and say, OK, this is how you do a get. This is how you do a put. So we want to tokenize a new credit card. I'm going to do a put to the Vermetric token server. Then Vermetric takes care of all the complexity. So we'll check at your identity management system who this user is and if they allow to take this action. We always tie back to our Vermetric Data Security Manager. So that contains all the encryption keys. It contains policies. And this could be up to a FIPS 140-2 level 3 key manager, or it could be a virtual appliance. We'll then take that data, securely enter it into the token vault. And to make sure it's secure in this token vault, we take off 15 years of encryption capability and the software that we already have out there in the field and being used, and we leverage that to encrypt that data within this token vault. And then ultimately give that tokenized data back to the database so that when it's entered in, it's no longer a clear text credit card number, but it's now a token representing that credit card number. So one of the questions that came up, I'll answer it right now, was can this credit card number be identified as a tokenized credit card, or would you think it's a real credit card? And the answer is it's what you want. So we have options of doing sequential tokens. So then it might be obvious to a user that it's not a real credit card number, or you could choose to do a random looking credit card number, or you could choose to have a random token created that would pass a LUN check. So if someone gets that token, they're going to think it's a real credit card number, but of course it's not, and they won't be able to use it. And you could just imagine, and I won't go through the details now, but when the customer service person tries to access that data, the same process is repeated, but this user only gets the last four. That's the policy that was set, and the rest of the information will be redacted. Uh, this example is a, a credit card, but it could be any data. This could be social security information, driver's license information. It could be a mix of alpha and numeric text, and we'll tokenize it and mask it. So some of the most common use cases for using tokenization is, you know, as Rich pointed out, it's because you have to, and typically with credit cards to pass your PCI DSS audit or to take certain amounts of data out of scope so it doesn't need to be audited, you'll want to tokenize. And that's the number one use case that we see. Uh, second, you have call center or other users, say, you know, nurses or doctors who don't need to see everyone's full Social Security number. Right? When they take blood, they make sure you're the right candidate. They say, what's your last four digits? 
So they should only see the last four digits. Then to de-identify sensitive data in a, a non-production database. And what I mean by that is often we need to give a copy of our database or a partial copy of a database to a third party. This could be an analytics company. It could be a testing company. And they might need to have credit card-like data or social security number-like data for testing, but they don't need the actual data. And we don't need to break our compliance requirements by giving them the actual data. So if you make a copy of a tokenized database or a partial copy, that data is masked, and you can now share that without breaking any kind of compliance requirements as long as there's no way for that third party to have access to your token database. And lastly, in this set of use cases is what Rich was talking about. If you're going to move data into the cloud and you want to assure uh, certain columns are not going to be um, hackable and someone can't steal your data, it's best to do that at the application layer. And we can enable you to to application encryption or tokenization. You could do that on your premise before you push that data out to the cloud. So that's for metric in a nutshell. So no matter where your data is going and you want to protect that sensitive data, whether it's at the application layer or at the file system layer, or even if you are using solutions like TDE and you want to appropriately manage those keys, the metric is the one platform that can meet all those use cases. So I went through that very quick because I really want to make sure that we have time for your questions. Um, and I'll let you know again that these slides are available now. Um, so you know, help yourself. Also, you know, thank you, Rich. Uh, he's uh, given you guys a sneak peek of his white paper, a cracking confusion, and we're making that available to you first. Um, and then when we finalize it, it'll also be available at Vermetric.com. So, Danielle, if we could jump on to the questions, well, that would be terrific. Sure. All right. Thank you, Rich and Charles. Great presentation there. We have several questions, so I'll jump in. Uh, the first question is, how does the tokenization work if multiple applications need to integrate with each other and applications need that PII information? Well, I could take first shot at answering that. Um, this you know, and I'll give you two pieces of that answer. So this can make things complicated. If you do have multiple applications, that need that same data that you're going to tokenize, you would have to update those applications to do the API calls to the Vermetric token server um, to be able to translate those tokens, essentially. Uh, one very interesting capability that uh, Vermetric offers in, their, in our tokenization solution is if you have multiple business groups using the same uh, token database, you could have multiple groups in there. We have a token group con concept where multiple organizations can share the same token database, but they can't translate each other's data. So um, this basically kind of virtualizes your token database for the different business groups. Hopefully that answers the question. Uh, Rich, is there anything you wanted to add? No, I think you got it. All right. Great. Uh, the next question is, how are keys safe with the SaaS provider, and how do you guard against admin access? So SaaS providers, uh, you, you don't exchange keys with them. If this is truly software as a service, they are responsible for encrypting everything. Uh, there's a couple of kind of platform as a service vendors, like Box.com is the main one right now, and some of Amazon.com as well that are allowing customers to manage their own keys and exchange those with the provider. And those are really packaged systems where you have to have a whole bunch of stuff around uh, around your key management appliances set up and, and relationships with them that's very limited. What other people do is, so that's the bring your own key piece of it. Um, that is very, very early to market. I think we're going to see a lot more of that moving forward. Uh, the other option that people do is they'll encrypt before it goes to the provider using proxies that are in line. Don't really like that approach, to be honest, but if that's all you have, that's all you have. Okay, got it. Um, the next question is, how is the security of tokenization uh, engines uh, assessed? Uh, I mean, they were comparing this to, I guess, the years of academic research with crypt cryptography, and if there was anything similar they could look to in tokenization. Well, I could talk to Not the metric solution, and then, mm -hmm. you know, Rich could add to it as more general, and, and then we could take it offline to go deeper. But on the metric solution itself, the token database and all the sensitive data is encrypted using the same you know, encryption techniques that we've 
been using for 15 years at Metric, and it's all AES-256. You, you know, the keys are kept in a FIPS-compliant key manager. So, um, you know, that database is, is pretty locked down in, you know, all the ways that, you know, one would expect and, and, and what you would, uh, you know, that's, that's been proven and tested over time. So, uh, Rich, I don't know if you want to add anything to that. Yeah, I mean, basically, the, the way that the tokens are generated, that is important to evaluate. There's not, like, an independent standard. There is a new standard, uh, an ISO standard, that's being worked on right now around that. For the most part, though, there's a bunch of different techniques you can use, and I've not heard of anybody making that mistake in tokenization, because it could just be random numbers, I mean, really, uh, that just are, are put together in a way that fits the format of what you need. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Um, we do have a few more questions, but uh, Vormetric will be able to follow up with them after the webcast, I guess individually with these folks. Um, we are going to close out the session now, but I want to thank Rich and Charles again for their presentation. Thank our listeners also for tuning in. This webcast will be available on demand beginning tomorrow on the SC Magazine website, and a PDF of the slides will be available after the webcast in the content section. Um, as a reminder, just want to make sure you join us next time. Uh, take care.